What's going on, everybody? David Gravel here. Thanks for uh, joining in. Um, we're getting this deal started. Obviously, we have a great guest and Brad Sweet. I'm very, really excited for uh, what we could talk about. And obviously, so many things got dropped with the high limit schedule. Eldora's big news. Uh, so we're really uh, looking forward to talking about that, getting Brad's perspective, uh, talking about um, everything we got going on and uh, me and Brad's battles, how long we've known each other, um, stuff like that. So uh, looking forward uh, to talking about our topics. I think hopefully we have a lot of people tuned in. Um, man, a million dollar to win race coming up. That's going to be amazing. Very exciting. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for joining, Joe. Mary, Stacy, Jay, Stacy, what's going on, guys? Thank you very much. Um, really excited for tonight. A lot of good things to talk about. News just drops every day. Uh, so very, very excited. Uh, we do have a new sponsor uh, for the channel and uh, hopefully more to come, but it's Marlowe's Metal Fabricating. We we're supposed to drop the video in the beginning. Uh, but it did not happen. Uh, a little bit technical difficulties, but we'll show you what Marlowe's there in Dover, Pennsylvania. Your specific requirements. So that's Marlowe's there, guys. He approached me after the first live stream we did last week and uh, wanted to be a part. So uh, we will be showing his video in different streams and then also in the beginning of our intro that we'll be building and our exit of all our videos uh, will be involved uh, with with us and, uh, and definitely people moving forward if they want to be involved in the channel. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, obviously we're going to talk to a lot of things with Brad. Um, we kind of have a good bit of history. We've been racing together since 2010. He had pretty similar uh, steps in his racing career, tried to do the NASCAR thing, didn't work out kind of like me. So um, yeah, we got a lot of stuff to dive into. V very excited. Won a World of Allah Champion. You need to beat these two guys to get it done. Yes, sir, Raz. Julie, what's going on? Tom, Stacy, Tuck, Jeff. Um, you know, thanks for tuning in, Brandon, Carrie, Uncle Mir. Thank you guys. I'm really excited. Uh, this should be a big hit. We should have a lot of people uh tuning in, and we got Brad Sweet waiting in the in the background to to get him in here. So, thank you, Stacy. Uh, hopefully, it's the start. We started our subscription deal as well. So, if you guys don't know about that, we put a little social media blast on it. Uh, but we have subscriptions, so then you'll have a little star next to your name. You'll have different um, emojis and uh, gifts that you could put on the chat that nobody else will. Uh, if you go to the second tier, you get all that plus shout outs and you get a small discount on my website and the top level, uh, you get the biggest discount uh, on my website. So I uh, appreciate you guys. We're looking forward to making this a big deal. Maybe one day it could be a podcast. Um, there's always going to be a lot to talk about. And then, you know, you guys want to know about the good, gushy stuff and stuff that mm -hmm. uh, maybe the fans don't know. Um, the, the hidden secrets, uh, kind of what happens out, out in the road and, and stuff like that. So um, we'll try to uh, get Brad Sweet in here any minute. And, uh, yeah, we'll get to talk about uh, what he's here for. What's up, Brad? Hey, Button, How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Just ate dinner, got home, and uh, hopping on uh, this YouTube live. Yeah, cool. It's uh, I think it's fun what you're doing. I think it's good interaction, and uh, man, there's lots of cool things to talk about, like you kind of mentioned there. So, a uh, million dollars, some high limit stuff, and uh, you know some good battles along the way. So, uh, cool. I'm glad uh, glad I'm here. I'm glad you're interacting with the fans, and glad we can take on some questions tonight. <clears throat> Yeah, for sure. There'll be plenty of questions. There's no doubt in that. Um, man, uh, it was perfect luck that Eldora announces a million dollar to win race like literally an hour before this. I don't know how that all happened, but I got no insider information on that. But I knew something was happening, but it was cool that it all worked out like that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really cool, you know, in sprint car racing and dirt track racing. Um, you know, it's just it just really legitimizes everything that's going on. I mean, the fact that we're able to, you know, the fact that Tony and Eldora and Flo are able to, to go ahead and, and put on a million to win race, not just a million dollar purse, but a million to win. Uh, 
you know, just says a lot about our sport in general. It says uh, a lot about our fan base and, and the growth and, and everything. And uh, it's just really exciting that the fact that, you know, we get to go out there and battle it out for a million dollars. So uh, I think it's huge. Uh, super excited. Obviously, I was a little bit in the know uh, on some of that. So I knew it was going to drop. That's We moved our high limit stuff up a little bit to, to not get lost in the uh, – the million dollar to win race at Eldora, but you know, we've been announcing our high limit stuff. It's been great, been exciting. And it's just fun time to be a sprint car racer right now with, uh, you know, all this fun, fun stuff getting announced. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, we were all jealous of late model guys, the money Davenport brought in this past year. And, uh, now we're going to have, honestly, I think equal opportunity for somebody to have a season like Jonathan Davenport. I think with, um, Houston's paying two fifty, you got, at least two two fifty thousand win races with you, so there's a lot of big chunk uh, races that you could potentially get to that two million dollar mark if somebody has a season like Brent Marks did this past year. I think it's honestly very doable. So that that's definitely exciting uh, to be a sprint car driver right now. Yeah, and I think the difference between like the late model side and what we're trying to do on the sprint car side is we're trying to keep the group together so there's still that compelling storyline of of racing for points where they kind of maybe, you know, maybe lost out a little bit, just got, you know, there were so many big races that guys just started chasing everything. So I think we're trying to be smart. You know, I think there's a lot of different influencers on, you know, in, in different positions, but I think we all have a, a, a common goal is to, you know, up the ante a little bit, but, you know, we still want to, to all be racing against each other and, and we still want to crown a champion at the end of the year. So uh, I think it's, it's cool how we're able to kind of work together. I know, uh, you know, it's not been easy to get to this point, but, you know, there's a lot of give and take along the way. Yeah. So do you follow the Dirt Tracker daily guy, Justin Fiedler, at all, kind of what he posts? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, he seems like he's very, uh, you know, World of Outlaw, World Racing Group, maybe centric. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. his opinions are, uh, you know, aligned a little more there. But, you know, it's uh, sure. those are his opinions. I think he actually worked for World Racing Group. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I think he's kind of you know, uh, a little more opinionated than you'd want to be, you know, yeah. than you'd want to hear about. Yeah. So my point for that was he posted a video 2019, the top 30 guys brought in 5.2 million, 2021 top 30 brought in 6.3, 2022, we brought in 6.8. I think this year with everything that's going on, I think we might hit like the 8 million mark probably with the top 30, which is, yeah, I'd good. have two comments on that. I mean, I think, uh, I think the COVID year was a bad year in general, but I think it helped the, the growth of the streaming. And I think that's where the late models maybe jumped on that a little quicker and you saw the bigger purses. Yep. And then I think, uh, you know, obviously for us, you know, the late models doing that, you know, then put pressure, you know, to get the sprint cars to a similar level. So I would like to see where the late models were and where they went versus where uh, the sprint cars were and where they went in the same amount of time. But it doesn't really matter uh you know opinions are opinions and uh at the end of the day it's really good that we're able to race for more money i think it's the fan base is growing we're, we're we see it you know we live in this world just like you me you know this is our lives you know we we see the fan base we know how much recognition you know much more recognizable we're getting and it's all coming from you know being on tv a lot more uh, a lot more people a lot more eyes on it so um, you know, I think it's, it's good for the growth. Um, you know, I, I think the team owners make a lot of sacrifices. The, the drivers make a lot of sacrifices, um, uh, you know, and the fans, you know, they, they're in the stands and they're watching the streaming service. So I think everybody's just kind of fighting for their fair share. And, uh, I think we're in a great place. I think competition, uh, isn't such a bad thing. And, and I think it's driven, uh, driven it up for sure. It's, it's a, it's exciting right now to, uh, to be a sprint car driver. I'm, I can't believe you know, all these different races out there in uh, 2023. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I feel like this past year, there was maybe a small decision on if you should do the outlaws or pick and choose or do the all-stars and you still get to run all the big races. But uh, this year, I think it's even up in the air more than ever, um, all the money to be had. Uh, if you win the million dollar race, what's the point of, of running for points, right? You could just sit <laughs> fat and happy the rest of the year. Um, yeah. Or if you win the, the Houston's race, right? So obviously you can't see into the future, but um, yeah. I think that um, 
everybody's happy and licking their chops. No matter if you're somebody like Danny Dietrich or Anthony Macri, or if you're, you know, I would say the top four outlaw guys like me, you, Carson and Donnie, um, you know, we're all excited. And then Brent Marks is excited. So um, it's definitely a, a really cool time. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, it's going to be crazy. I think there's going to be a lot of decisions to be made. And I think a lot of people, there might be new people on the outlaws. There might be people that have been on the outlaws for a long time, no longer run it as well. So it's going to be, I think, an odd year, a different year, because I think there's so much going on. Everybody's like cross-eyed. They don't know what's what to do, what the best thing to do is. You know, it's it's pretty crazy. Well, and I think you made a couple of good points there. I think your decisions on uh, can change throughout a season. You know, if you're not having a great year, then, you know, maybe you won't chase points. Maybe you'll chase money. You know, I think – Brian Carter with World Racing Group was really smart and you know some of the things that he did were pretty strategic and and you know making that 350,000 very uh you know lucrative uh, obviously for guys that think they could have a chance at that uh you know keeps you chasing that to a certain point and and those are you know some of the guys that that he you know is trying to make sure he keeps myself uh yourself and Carson Donnie Sheldon you know he's trying to keep the the group together shark racing it there's a lot of great cars it's it's you know he wants to keep the group together that's you know what he has and then you know all these big races so you know uh the one aspect that that not a lot of people talk about is the value of freedom and when you have family and and when you've been doing it a long time you know you have to it's hard to put a monetary value of course you're going to go try to make the most money that you can ever make for your family um you know but it all comes at a, a cost right and that's you know, when you have a, a young son like you just had, and I have a daughter at five years old, you know, that does get thrown in the equation. And so when you do look at the late model side and, and some of the earnings they were getting without the sacrifice of the commitment, you know, the, a little bit of freedom, obviously you're racing a lot, but man, if I need a weekend off, you can take it off. And, and Brett Marks kind of did that this year, which, you know, made us all think twice about what we're doing a little bit. And, and then, uh, you know, obviously now the high limit, you know, uh, tour is coming out with, with, 12 midweek races that are big pain. Now the millions coming out. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's very different landscape than it was, you know, one year ago. So uh, I think you're going to see uh, drivers change their mind halfway through the season. I think uh, you're going to see, you know, just, it's just a liquid situation. So a lot of money to be out there. A lot of uh, great events. Um, you know, you can't thank Tony and Flo and Eldora enough. You can't thank Todd Quirin enough. You can't thank Knoxville Raceway enough and, you know, all the all the promoters that are that are pushing the envelope and putting up bigger and bigger purses and bigger money and creating bigger and bigger events. It's great for our sport, uh, whether it's with the World of Outlaws, whether it's other events, you know, it's just uh, competition driving this thing up for sure. Yeah, I mean, the crazy thing to me is that Knoxville Nationals this year is going to be the fourth highest paying race to win, but we know that Knoxville's purse is one of the best and pretty much is the best purse. I feel like that we race for now. We haven't seen the Houston's full payout and then we haven't seen the million payout, but in comparison to Kings Royal to, to Knoxville payout, the Knoxville payout is uh, great, but uh, I don't think it's still going to water down the event. The Knoxville nationals is still super prestigious, but I feel like it's going to put some pressure on Knoxville that, Maybe they have to do a little something extra to add a little bit of incentive or excitement because when you throw a million dollars out there, I mean, that's crazy. You know what I mean? That's that's insane. So uh, then Houston's throwing 250 out there. So it's going to be interesting how that all is. But, you know, you and me, when we first started sprint car racing, every other event didn't mean as much but the Knoxville Nationals. Obviously, Kings Royal is the second and then maybe National Open's third. But now it's that outlook is completely different. Just like before we were real wing sprint car drivers, you had the gold cup when it was super pre prestigious. Now that went away. Now you're running gold cup and Chico. I feel like now you're trying to bring that back. You know what I mean? So now the landscape of all these crown jewel events is it's pretty wild. Yeah. You know, and Knoxville was the first to kind of understand, uh, you know, the best way to keep a hundred cars coming is to have the purse pay, you know, really far back and, you know, make it meaningful for, you know, with the big invert and giving, giving guys a chance. And, you know, even if you run the C main at the Knoxville Nationals, you do pretty well. So uh, their event is is super special. It's always going to be, 
you know, highest on the list of prestigious, you know, especially at this moment. Obviously, the million, I mean, it's something special, but, you know, you don't know how how many years. I mean, it's probably a one and done, you know, might come back yeah. every couple of years type of situation. So yeah. I don't think it's I don't think it's really trying to compete with the prestige of like the Knoxville Nationals. You're still going to want to put your name on that trophy. Obviously, everybody's going to want to win a million dollars, but only one guy's going to win. Uh, yeah. I think the Kings Royals definitely, you know, the prestige of the Kings Royals elevated uh, the last few years. And, you know, it, it's starting to rival what the Knoxville Nationals is. So obviously, you know, I think Knoxville is going to look at things. And once again, competition is going to going to drive things up or, or they're going to make adjustments to make sure that they stay in the limelight and, and keep the prestige where it needs to be. And, yeah. uh, you know, I always stated that, you know, it's not, yes, you want to put your name on a trophy, but the money goes with that too. I mean, it's not, you know, it doesn't become pre prestigious if it only if it doesn't pay a lot. So, yeah. you know, like the, the Kings Royal and what Earl always did at Eldora was always trying to elevate things. And Knoxville was, the, you know, they really took a big step. And, you know, that's why they always separated themselves. And that's why they they were the most prestigious events for sure. So, Cole, you saw a question pop up. So he pays for this question. It gets put up above everybody. So we got to ask. He says, are you guys renting out? uh eagle or how does that all work so like obviously are you co-promoting or like i mean kind of how does that all work out he's from that area he's yeah. a kid that helps out carson macedo 41 car every once in a while yeah good question uh obviously we can't get into every detail of, yeah. of what we do business wise with with each each track but uh eagle has a great owner in roger hayden and uh, got to know him pretty well and we were able just to put a business deal that, that works well for him works well for the high limit tour he's excited to bring you know a national 410 series back and you know i think that area uh omaha lincoln area um you know eagle's such a cool racetrack so uh we're we're really excited uh to do business with with the haydens and uh you know to have myself and kyle and and the high limit tour you know go to such a cool racetrack uh that he he really does take really good care of that place uh we're super excited Man, I'm surprised mm -hmm. with I-80 going away that the Outlaws didn't try to get an event there. Uh, we were there a few years ago. Obviously, there must be some sort of bad mm -hmm. blood or it just doesn't work out. You know, we've already seen that you have high limit races and we have outlaw races at the same places like Lakeside and Houston. So it's not like that can't happen. Um, so I'm very surprised, uh, you know, that region doesn't call for, I guess, enough to have an outlaw show. But you know, that's a track that everybody talks about, that everybody wants there. It seems like there's such big uh, buzz around it. So I think it's a good opportunity for high limit, but I'm just surprised the Outlaws haven't done anything with that. I think they would go there. Uh, you know, I think the date that they would, you know, the SLS would have liked to gone uh, didn't work with the racetrack just because of something that the racetrack does at their facility. So, uh, yeah. you know, I think that our date just being, you know, kind of, in the middle of the summer was, you know, worked out well for, for both parties. And I can't speak on all the other relationships, but um, yeah. yeah, they, they seem really excited about it. Yep. So uh, let, let's just talk about, I guess your schedule quick, but uh, man, I was very surprised to see Lakeside be your one year 50,000 to win races. Um, what made you guys choose Lakeside to throw that big money down on? Obviously, uh, our outlaw races were always around the NASCAR weekend. And then the last year or two was not around the NASCAR weekend and still had a great crowd. So um, SLS was promoting that event before. Um, obviously it seats plenty of people. It's a pretty big track. So what made you have the one of your biggest races be at Lakeside and, you know, one of the first ones of the year? Yeah. I mean, I think good question. I think for one, you're searching for a facility that can handle, you know, the crowd that it's going to take to pay the 50,000 to win uh, a track that has a good reputation. And then obviously with the way we're doing things, we had to, you know, give the outlaw guys a chance to, to be at these races. So we can't be, you know, out of the region. And, um, you know, I think that's why Lakeside, uh, worked for us. Obviously we were looking in kind of the Kansas area, Kansas city, Missouri area. We wanted a good professional venue, uh, something that we, we knew would do good. And, you know, to your point, I mean, uh, that Kansas City market seems like they're very passionate about sprint car racing. I mean, when we go to that lakeside race at the end of the season in October, uh, the fans are very passionate 
whether NASCAR was in the area or not. Uh, honestly, I thought it did better this year when the when NASCAR wasn't around. So, um, you know, I reached out to to Scott Boyd and made sure that he, you know SLS would be okay if we held an event there in, in April and. Uh, you know, they were okay with us trying it and, and Darren, uh, at Lakeside, uh, the promoter there, uh, you know, was really receptive and, and Shane Stewart's a part of the event as well. So, uh, you know, we all kind of worked a deal out, feel like it's a, a good place to start the year. Um, you know, you have to start a certain point because we need to do 12 races and they all have to be midweek and they got to fit in in the 48 hours or a hundred miles. And we don't want to step on, you know, things that are already in the middle of the week, uh, you know, Ohio Speed Week, PA Speed Week. So, you know, we, we have to start at some point and uh, yep. this kind of led us to to that venue. And, um, you know, we wanted to kick the season off uh, with our, our first points race, uh, paying, you know, 50000 to win. Yeah, man, uh, that's cool. Lakeside's not been my best track, I could say. You're, you're pretty decent at there, but... Um, Kokomo is obviously one I'm really excited for. Um, who knows if I'll go there or not, depending on which races. Uh, Wayne County, I see, pays 32000 Is Is Sheldon going to be involved in promoting that event like he was last year? Yeah, basically that's just a continuation of where we were last year. Uh, it was paying 30, uh, 32000 last year. Sheldon you know, jumped on board, got some sponsorship, and uh, Phil Durst came in and, and kicked in another ten grand. So. We basically just thought uh, we just keep all that alive from last year. Um, you yeah. know, unfortunate rain came in right before it started. We had a, a great buzz and a great field of cars, and everything was shaping up to be good. But that's part of promoting. Um, you know, so we rolled it in this year, gave them a May date, so we're earlier in the season, and uh, you know, obviously really excited about that event. I think it'll it'll be good. Yeah, I think obviously a hot and shield. It- in Worcester, Ohio, and in that area, they're going to have that place packed. It's definitely going to be a we good did, event. We did announce the next three. You don't have on here, but we do have nine of the twelve announced. So uh, we we got that picture here, but it's just on a tweet because somebody only posted the first six, but not the first nine. So we got okay. Grandview there, got Houston's there, got Lernerville there. Um, you know, Grandview man was one of my. Uh, most favorite tracks growing up pa speed week uh urc events early in my career i always loved grandview but houston's obviously that's an interesting one because it's kind of around the jackson nationals i believe um and that's going to be a pretty big week for money to be had as well um so that's going to be interesting because not a lot of guys travel to the jackson nationals in years past i feel so now this gives guys like brett marks or macri or maybe even Danny Dietrich to get off the porch for more than one weekend. <laughs> we and know Danny's not getting off the porch. Yeah, he yeah he's pretty spoiled. Can, you know he can barely he can barely make it to Port Royal on time. So we know he's not he's not well enough prepared to leave Pennsylvania. Usually at Volusia by about the third night he's he's pretty much ready to go home. So and yeah. he he blames the tra- it, the tracks too round for him. So I think the PA <laughs> tracks are, are are good for him, and he should probably just stay on the porch really. Yeah, and maybe it's just not cut cut out for him. He's more of an Ohio Speed Week guy and PA Speed Week guy. But Lernerville, that's the one I'm most excited for. Uh, one of my favorite tracks. Uh, facility's pretty nice, but, man, they seat a lot of people. And the racetrack is typically racy. 90% of the time, it puts on good racing. Um, obviously, being 50,000, that's start on my calendar. We're definitely going to be there no matter what. That's that's one we're, we're for sure going to. So looking forward to that. Um, I think that the people in PA uh, were sad to see the Outlaws not come there. I'm told that the All-Star races weren't that great of a crowd. Uh, but if you bring 80 90% of the Outlaw guys to this high limit race, I think the crowd will be back big and paying 50000 I think uh, that will be another really, really good event. Yeah, we're excited for Lernerville. I mean, it's a no-brainer. That's like you like you said, it seats a lot. It's one of the raciest tracks we go to, and you know we've had great races there every single time. And um, yeah, just we knew that there was a big void. I mean, I I feel it. I felt it last year. Not going to Lernerville was just was just crazy to me. Uh, it was always something I just loved to go into. So obviously, when we built the high limit schedule, that was the first event. You know, figuring out a date for Lernerville and when and and we knew it would pay big just, you know, because it's a, a track that deserves it. The fans always embrace it. And, 
you know, we want to bring, uh, you know, a, a high level, you know, big sprint car race back to back to there for sure. Obviously, Husits, uh, you know, your car owner owns Husits. So, you know, been having some great conversations with Todd and his group and uh, been able to, you know, basically what we felt like uh, the high limit race would do is, uh, you know, we know we're going to have some guys following our uh, series that, that might be some outsiders. And uh, we, we want to help try to elevate uh, the Jackson Nationals. And, uh, you know, Houston's is a great place. It's it's a perfect venue for what we're trying to do. You know, small bull ring, exciting racing. And uh, you'll come off the Knoxville Nationals. We're all going up there anyway to run, you know, to start the Jackson Nationals on Thursday. So having out at Houston's, uh, we felt like was, was good for everybody involved. And, uh, you know, obviously Grandview, uh, you know, I haven't raced there in a while, but, but non-wing racing probably back in like 2009 or 10, always a great crowd, always a great place. Uh, they already have a, you know, thunder on the hills or on Tuesday night. So, yeah. uh, it just, you know, that one fit, fit really, really well. So we're, we're excited to, to announce the last three tomorrow. I think two people could probably kind of guess and figure out, uh, there's one, one surprise tomorrow. That's a little, uh, a little shake up in, in the overall schedule. It'd be a little different than what people were thinking, but we're pretty excited about it. Yeah, for sure. Um, Looking forward to the other three events. Um, you know, I might know a little information, but not all of it, but uh, I'm excited for a surprise. Hopefully the one surprise you have happens and it's, uh, you know, really cool for our sport. So looking forward to that. But we could talk about the juicy outlaw stuff and decisions and stuff like that. But I want to show a little clip of an old race and then we could just talk about that a little bit. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about some old times maybe some new times, but we'll talk about the real juicy stuff at the end okay. with what races we could run, what races we can't run. Uh, what are we going to do? What races are allowed or not? So um, hopefully Carter starts his video here in a second and uh, yeah, let's start. Chop. People don't know that Sheldon right there in the 93 in the black car right in right in front of us coming to the white flag here. Man, that 89G was so good looking, man. I, I'm a little. Oh, of course. Hey, hey, can we can we get Carter to drum up one where I where I beat you on the on the last lap or something, or where you're right behind me? <laughs> uh, I know, I know. I don't even know if we have any other races like that. All star races where we're running one too. <laughs> no, that, that was good times. I remember that year uh, running Ohio Speed Week. Uh, I didn't run them all, uh, but you were doing good. I think you had won like two or three or four of those things. And Not even. That was my first race. That was my first win. That was my oh, really? first okay. career win ever. I won Ohio Speed Week that year. I finished in the top 10 at every event, but I only okay. won one. I actually, earlier in the week, I ran out of fuel coming out of turn four at the beautiful Hilltop Speedway, and Rob yeah. Cheney passed me on the last corner. But, um, yeah. man, your car – it nearly looks the same as it does say. Like I feel like KKR was ahead of their time with the designs, right, and the numbers. And Blackbeard had something 15 years ago, 10 years ago, that nobody else had. Like today, yeah. what you have is very normal, and everybody else has about the same stuff. But back yeah. then, the cars looked amazing. Like the Budweiser car, one of the best looking cars ever. Uh, the even the Roth 83 with Paul McMahon in it, that was a badass looking car as well. Um, yeah, I think I think Casey's done a really good job. He always put pressure on us to, you know, to create new bodies, and he would spend the money to, you know, to to separate ourselves. Which, you know, that's hard. It's a hard thing to do, but from a marketing standpoint and, and sponsorship standpoint, it allowed us to, you know, to really look different on the racetrack. And uh, you know, obviously now everybody's kind of caught up, and 
you know, it's it's hard, it gets harder and harder to to make those changes for sure. Yeah, so that video, man, you were nice to me. I don't know if you'd be that nice today throwing that slider. I think you would have came across, no, no doubt. I think, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, I'm definitely uh, a little more aggressive nowadays in, in my racing, but uh, I think you have to be with the group that we have nowadays. Oh, for sure. It, it seems like, uh, you know, I think we all race each other really hard, and, you know, we honestly don't wreck each other a lot. We, we get a little mad at each other, and but, it, you know, I feel like uh, the aggression over the, the last few years is – uh just the aggressiveness uh, i think there's a lot of respect still there i think uh but it's definitely more aggressive racing and there's more parity so i think uh when the move's there you, you definitely have to to make it and it's uh it's it's changed for sure in the last uh, four or five years all right so we had another paid question and we got to ask it because mm -hmm. that's the perk of paying for a question because mm -hmm. you guys run in the chili bowl and if not why uh you know i me and you drove for the same team the last couple years uh, we had a good deal where we were compensated to show up no matter where we finished. Um, so that was a good perk for us. It was also a great team with a Chili Bowl winning crew chief um, with the best equipment money could buy. Uh, I'll answer the question first. Why am I not doing it? Uh, that team is shrinking down to two cars at Chili Bowl, to my knowledge. Um, and I don't have a deal like I had with them uh, moving forward. Now, a couple of people have asked me to run, but with my newborn kid, uh, it's not as appealing to me them adding another day to the event. So now you got to be there kind of for nine days instead of eight because you got to be there the day before and the day after. Um, so that's another reason. And again, me having a kid and if I can't make money, the off season or the eight or nine days off is worth it for me. Uh, I do have fun at the Chili Bowl. I love the Chili Bowl. Um, but obviously there's a lot of buzz around it right now. Some people are boycotting it. Um, I would say I'm not boycotting it specifically, um, but I'm against what the race pays, in my opinion. Um, and I know that Kyle's probably not running it. Christopher Bell might not be. I don't know what the real real story is on there. I'm guessing Sunshine will be there, and I'm guessing Rico probably will be there, but I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, I guess you can answer that question too. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, similar to David, you know, statement, I think, you know, basically what David's saying is he's not boycotting it, but he doesn't make money there. So, you know, why would you go? And I think that's kind of the, you know, I think with adding a day, you know, adding, uh, you know, time away from your family, uh, you know, and then just, you know, you're only on the track a few times and then not really any chance to make money. Um, yeah, it's just, it's tough. It's hard for me to, to look at that race as like, you know, on the same level as some of the other stuff that's going on. They just announced a million to win at Eldora, you know, and we're, we're there for two nights. So I get it, you know, and I'm good on uh, the Hans and, you know, for, for building an event. I know it's a lot of work, uh, but I, I just think, like, I'm not going to go as a professional driver, you know, that, that makes a living racing to an event that I'm going to basically lose money at almost no matter what, you know, and it's uh, – you know, you can say you can get sponsors or an owner can pay you, but that's that's not what this business model or that's not what dirt racing is about. You know, it's uh, if you got something prestigious enough and 300 cars show up and it's like eight nights and, you know, 10,000, 15,000 people there, whatever's there, you know, it it just the numbers just aren't adding up yeah. for me. And, uh, you know, I don't foresee myself going back and unless it makes more sense financially and uh you know for me and my family yeah i i agree again i feel like sometimes us as drivers people could view as us whining or complaining or only doing it for the money but uh when we do it for a living and that's why we <laughs> do it and then we have the choice to have time off after you know racing 75 times being away for six seven months um solid months um you know to me you balance those things out and at the end of the day, if you could maybe uh, pay off your vehicle or, or put money towards your house or maybe buy a new merchandise trailer or truck, you know, maybe those things will incentivize you to go and do those things. But if not, I mean, we have families. We are married currently and we want to stay that way. Yeah. Yeah. And golden drillers aren't paying my mortgage. You know, the, the yeah. check you get that comes along with the golden driller or, or the big events or what what pay my bills and uh, what keep my family and life, you know, uh, rocking and rolling so um yeah i mean it's just it's it's just all business you know it is what it is yeah. I mean, 
Uh, this is this is as much as people don't want to hear. Oh, it's not all about the money. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it, a lot of it actually is. Uh, you know, when you make a living and it's all performance based, and you know, basically you don't make money if you don't run good. So uh, yeah. until you put yourself in that position, it's hard to really understand where where a driver's coming from. But uh, you know, it's uh, I don't know. It just is what it is. Yeah, right here. Cole's got a question for you. It's a it's a pretty funny question because. I would say about 50% of the races you come up to me, man, could you breathe in the car? Like, I just can't breathe. Like this arm guard's got me all effed up. Like what's going on? So you took, you taking the arm guard on off. Looks like you finally made a neat looking aerodynamic with stickers on it for Charlotte. And maybe, maybe that's why you had a solid weekend because you could actually breathe and, and uh, you're good to go there. Yeah. Look out 2023, no arm guard. Uh, Yeah. Basically, to answer his question, uh, since it's a, a solid question and, and probably people wonder why, um, you know, I've, I've always had a left side arm guard at KKR, kind of back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, is, is something that Casey's always, you know, asked us to do or, or wanted, and it was just a KKR way of doing things, and, you know, I've gotten used to it, and, uh, you know, just this is where, how we build our cars, this is how our bodies are, it's how our sponsorships, you know, yep. are laid out on the cars and everything. Uh, but this year at Skagit, I think it just hit me, you know, about halfway through one of the nights. I, uh, whether I'm getting older or something was in the dirt or just the fumes have been really bothering me. And uh, I've been getting more and more fumes and, and kind of like, you know, when you're racing, you don't want to be thinking about can you can or not breathe, you know. And, uh, you know, there was that thought was crossing my mind at times and uh, just came in and told the guys, like, I'm just kind of done with having that thought cross my mind as far as the fumes and the brake dust. And, you know, when you have that left side arm guard, it just, the, the air never clears. So certain racetracks, the air gets real stale and Skagit's always been tough on me. And Houston's is another one. It's just the size of the track with the wall and the outside and everything. It just seems like it doesn't. So uh, I took it off and I just felt so much better at the end of the, the night, you know, the end of the race and just not with the air hitting me and, and fresher, cleaner air. So, uh work towards it me and casey had a couple you know conversations he he didn't love it but you know he understands and i think we're going to move forward with no arm guard for uh for this season that's good that's good so somebody asked some questions um which we'll get to questions at the end but this is a good one because i know nothing about it somebody asked what's the deal with the five kkr car are you going to have a three car team question mark the five kkr car um i don't know about a five kkr car to be All honest. right. So, so this I guy, don't... his name's Aloha. So I don't know. Maybe he's, you know, in Hawaii over there and he's got some insider information. But, um, yeah, I don't know nothing about it. Oh, along yeah. with the, the Chaz is in here. You know, everybody's got to tune into the Chaz tomorrow night. He's yeah. Brad's going to be on there. Get to talk about. <laughs> so damn lucky to have this million dollar announcement minutes before Chaz. I mean. It, what's going on you don't on think this is you don't think this is planned the chaz i mean come on man yeah this must be an illuminati thing this must be if you're talking to the chaz this must you know it's not a coincidence yeah we we knew we knew the announcement was coming and, and david said do you want to be on tomorrow and i said yeah i think it'll be a good it'll be there'll be some definitely good talking points uh tomorrow so oh, you better sure. get your, you better get your questions ready for tomorrow chaz uh, yeah, I'll be in there, and he'll definitely have a laundry list of questions for you. I'll, I'll be tuned in watching, and I'll give him some love. But he'll have the full schedule to talk to you about, so that'll be good for him. Um, it seems like he announced that he was having you on, and then I did right after. But I did have you before I knew that Chaz was having you on the next day. But, um, you know, we got 805 people watching live right now, so I appreciate it. That, that's pretty solid for me. Last week we had about 300, but – we got million dollar race to talk about. We got high limit races to talk about. We got the world of outlaws to talk about. So it's very, very exciting time for sprint car racing. And there's a lot of juices flowing, man. I don't know if ever in sprint car racing that there's been one, this much money to be had, but two mm-hmm. more pissed off people ever. <laughs> and then, you know, then things get announced and people still aren't happy. Like it's pretty crazy. I think 2022 now 2023 coming up. I feel like that's just the world we live in nowadays. We always want more. Mm -hmm. We want it now. Um, And it just, it just, I don't know. It's super odd, but I don't, I feel like there hasn't been this much animosity in sprint car racing in a long time. Yeah. I mean, I, 
I, I think it's just, you know, everybody's trying to make sure they're getting their fair share. I think the owners are spending a lot of money. Uh, you know, hotel rooms went up, diesel went up, yep. you know, business, you know, every business is still tough. And, and when you're, you know, very passionate about something and you're spending money on something, I, I just think, and you kind of, there's not a lot of transparency on, you know, maybe what world racing group is bringing in from that, from its pay-per-view. They're just, you know, you're unsure. I think the owners are just unsure if they're getting a fair cut, you know, and I think they just yeah. want something more sustainable. And you're talking about a pretty elite high level group of smart businessmen and, and people that have been around for a long time that, you know, get talking and comparing numbers as a group. And, you know, I think some of it's just stories. Some of it's probably not true, you know, of, of pay-per-view numbers, but there's just, there's no way for us to know. And, and then you just, once that question's out there, uh, that's what, where the conversations start to go wrong, I feel like. And, you know, I think that's a, it's a tough thing for World Racing Group and, and Brian Carter. I think he's always going to fight that with the, with the way he does with his transparency and his, his, you know, if he's not willing to share numbers, I mean, we're trying to sell sponsorships and trying to show value for our sponsors and we can't, you know, basically provide those numbers. Um, you know, the, the teams want to know how much the series you know, or Royal Racing Group revenue-wise is bringing in. They want to make sure they're getting their fair share. And, you know, I mean, every major sporting league or, you know, F1 or NASCAR, it's it's all a revenue split. So I think just the lack of transparency is always going to have that question. I I don't I don't think Brian's necessarily probably done a bad job. I, I, I can't yeah. say, but you'll never know. And I think when that question's out there is why the animosity starts and why you see – uh, the bickering and, and, you know, basically these negotiations trying to take place of, you know, uh, you know, we want more and we want more and we want more, um, you know, if it's a revenue split or, or something like that, I think, you know, and it's just, it's cut and dry and there's transparency and you know what's going on. I think all that goes away, but I don't know if we'll ever get there. For sure. So we got some paid questions here. Um, David Webb uh, said thoughts on Bristol not returning this year. Uh, I know how Brad feels, but I'll give you my thoughts. Um, I believe they're supposed to take banking out of the track this this past year to slow it down. Um, and to my knowledge, I didn't see or feel a difference, and I don't think it slowed the track down at all. Um, I feel like wing sprint car racing, our cars are fast. We're very aero-dependent. Um, the track's big. It says it's you know a half mile, but it seems about the one of the biggest tracks that we race on. Like It must be like – bigger than rolling wheels in my opinion um but um i just think that some of the the first year you know some of the a mains were actually excuse me decent and then kyle larson spencer basin had a great finish uh this past year but i think overall the heat races are extremely boring which that happens on a lot of tracks we race at as well but um i just think that it costs a lot to have the event. And then you saw the crowd this year compared to last year. It was nowhere near. I, I really wish that Bristol wasn't during COVID for that first uh, splash of the event because we, we were restricted for um, fans there. But I just think, one, it's a little bit dangerous. Two, it's extremely fast, hard on our equipment, and the racing uh, isn't the best. So um, I feel like um, business-wise it doesn't make sense. And, you know, people – weren't comfortable racing at it either yeah i i echo the same sentiment i mean just wasn't super comfortable ever like you're just it's just way bigger than what it looks like you get going way faster and you know it's not the the stuff that when you're in control of you're fine with it's it's just when something goes wrong is what you're worried about and you just worry about tires and, and parts you know that that aren't used to maybe those types of loads or speeds um you know just something going wrong and then you know obviously i think you know, going there for the first year was, you know, was cool, nostalgic. I mean, we were racing, you know, out of the great Coliseum. It was cool. Yep. The second year didn't have the vibe. It didn't have the feel. And I, I know it's an expensive, you know, event for, for everyone involved. And so if the crowd's not going to be there, it's, it's not really doing anything for anybody at that point. And uh, I think that's why we kind of moved away from it. Yeah, for sure. We have, we have another paid question by Mark. Was it easy to pick for Kyle to want to bring the series to Grandview since he loves racing that track every year? Um, obviously, he always did PA Speed Week, right? So he has a lot of laps or a lot of experience there. So 
that's not a question for me. That's definitely a question for you. Yeah, I mean, obviously Kyle's uh, influence on our high limit schedules heavy. Uh, you know, he's he loves certain tracks, and uh, you know, we don't want to necessarily go to, you know, if there's four or five outlaw shows at a place, we're not. That's not where we're trying to go. So Grandview, I feel like, it's been a place that's not been a part of the outlaw schedule for a long time, and uh, they they do have a Thunder on the Hill that's on Tuesday night. I mean, a yeah. lot of things fit, and then obviously Kyle. Uh, you know, loves that place and has won there and is, you know, uh, it was, a, that was honestly a very easy pick. Even, even for myself, it, it made a lot of sense. For sure. All right. So, uh, you know, people are, are throwing comments out there and stuff like that. Um, did World Racing Group share the Dirt Vision revenues with you guys? You know, no, they did not. But uh, let, let's maybe talk about um, a little bit of the juicier stuff with the outlaws. I mean, um, obviously me and you have always, if, if we're going to be racing mm -hmm. sprint cars mm -hmm. for a career, it was always mm -hmm. the world mm -hmm. of outlaws. We wanted to be world of outlaw drivers. So, um, I feel like it still is that way. Um, after doing it for quite a while, um, you know, there's things that you learn or, or, you know, figure out and, and, you know, the business side really well, but, um, I feel like what they announced with these bonus packages and stuff um, with this four race to eight race thing, you know, we don't know uh, exactly if this million dollar race is going to count towards that. Um, is the Capitani Classic going to count towards that? Is the front row challenge going to count towards that? I feel like these are things since they announced, it just brings up more questions and it almost fogs it up a little bit more. Like, I think you and me don't have a clear cut answer on what we want to do next year. I would love and want to be a world of outlaw, but if, um, you know, the Eldora has two events for that million, uh, that counts for two, the Capitani's three. Um, so then at this moment I can only run, you know, one high limit race to still get the full benefit package through the outlaws. So, um, I hope that they let us know here sooner than later. So, we could plan out what we want to do. And especially for the teams that depend on sponsorship at the highest level, you know, you guys with Napa, mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. all ball with the 41 car, um, you know, CJB with uh, true timber, right. These people are extremely dependent on, uh, you know, your guys sponsorship and, you know, sponsors want to run certain races and do certain things. So um, I feel like, a lot of people want to know, oh, could you run the million? You know, the million looks like it's unsanctioned and it's flow racing. It's not dirt vision. It's not world of outlaws. It's not high limit. So to me, it's like, what do we do moving forward? It's like, we need more information. Yeah, we need clarity. I mean, the, I was just laughing at some of the comments. Well, the outlaws can't race the million. It's like, uh, there's no rule in the world that's going to make me not be able to race for a million dollars. I mean, yeah. It's like you're just not going to make a rule. I don't really care what anybody says. I'm racing for the million dollars, and I would assume yeah. every outlaw guy is going to go race for a million dollars. It's just, it just doesn't matter what anybody says. Uh, you know, it's just uh, those are opportunities are once in a lifetime, maybe. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we need clarity on, you know, we've always had four nights at Eldora. So those two nights all of a sudden counting against our two nights is the cappy. We, you know, we've always had four or five races through a season that we've had freedom. You know, so for, for them to say that, you know, they're giving us a four nights of freedom, I, I think that that should mean actually four more nights of freedom, not, uh, you know, basically the same thing. Now all these races, now we have to pick and choose. It's It definitely puts pressure on, you know, uh, you know, especially as you move down the list of guys that maybe not don't have a chance at winning the points or, or are going to finish as high up in points. You know, I mean, it's definitely a less incentive to, to sign up and be super committed. I mean, there's a lot of money to chase, uh, you know, throughout the schedule. So, um, yeah, I think we need clarity. I think the world racing group needs to think through some things. Uh, you know, I think we as a group would, would like clarity so we can make our decisions. I think we'd like, you know, some give and take a little, I mean, if the Eldora event is going to count, I don't think it should count as two nights. I think maybe one would be a good compromise, uh, to allow us to go to another high limit race or, it's not just about high limits, but other races that that are out there, whether it's the Capitani, the Oski race, uh, you know, Terry McCall's race or or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I think you should be able to go, uh, you know, do things that you want to do with your race team. I think that was the ask from the from the owners is to have a little extra freedom, um, you know, and I, I think I hopefully we can, you know, I think we can get on the same page. I, I hope anyway. Um, otherwise, it just keeps putting us putting pressure on us to make 
you know, more difficult decisions. I mean, I, I, I don't, you know, think that's good for anybody. I think we all kind of yeah. want the same thing. I mean, you yeah. and I want to race for a championship, you know, against all the best guys. And, you know, if we can't do that, you know, if we can't get a few things that we're asking for, then it maybe pushes us to a point where we maybe go do something else or, mm -hmm. you know, that freedom situation starts to stand out. Well, Hey, I can run 12 races here, run for a million, still run a lot of the big outlaw races. I mean, and have some freedom in my life. I mean, it, you know, so yeah, I, I hope they give us some clarity so we can make some decisions. And I hope that they do, you know, do come up with a little give and take there. I, I don't think, um, you know, it can't just be all optics. There actually has to be a gain, um, you know, for the teams. Yeah, I agree. So some guy kind of, everybody's kind of talking about what we're talking about, but a guy has another paid question just joined, but it sounds like this could be like the PJ tour versus the live golf tour money talks. Again, what I said before, it's not all about the money. If we get treated fairly and we feel like we're making the amount of money we can, uh, then I think everybody's okay. But if, say one side's making $20 million and we're splitting, you know, $2 million between 12 or 14 teams, you know, that's when we're questioning, you know what I mean? And, and again, it's, it's fair, you know, people, uh, you know, the Dallas Cowboys, right. Uh, he makes a lot more money than, than Dak Prescott, um, Jerry Jones. But um, at the end of the day, um, Dak Prescott works for his big contract and, gets paid kind of what he wants to get paid or feels like he deserves. So um, I feel like the live golf tour is changing the game as far as the PGA tour and putting a lot of heat on these guys. And it's kind of uncharted territory. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting to see if the live tour sticks around, but I feel like, again, we want to be world of outlaws. We want to, if, if the world of outlaws goes away, our 70s, whatever races that we've won in our career goes away. Like, and, and I don't think, any of us want that, but if, uh, you know, things change, you know, that things change. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm in agreement. I don't think it's exactly like live golf because I mean, I don't think it's Saudi money, just, you know, crazy millions of dollars. I think what we're actually doing is, you know, there's a little competition out there that's putting a little pressure on, you know, the situation and, um, you know, it's fair competition. And I think what we're asking for is fair, you know, I don't think it's anything's really crazy. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I look forward, I look forward to just, you know, working through this, uh, hopefully civilly. And I think what the high limits did with their 12 rate with our 12 races, um, you know, is fair for now. And, you know, I think Tony doing a million dollar to win race, you can't, can't complain about that. I mean, uh, it's all good and healthy, uh, competition out there. And, and I think, uh, that's, that's never bad, uh, for any industry. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. Competition breeds uh, for everybody to step it up, obviously. You know, I mean, just like what Todd's doing at Houston's, like they went from, you know, no big events to now they were 100,000 this past year. Now they're at 250. Then they have an event for 23,000 with you. And now uh, they have one of the bigger late model events, you know, taking over the I 80 event. So just like it's cool to see uh, people stepping up and, and people getting rewarded with, with big events. And um, it looks like, you know, people can play nice, right? Todd's got events that are flow racing events and Todd has, uh, you know, mostly dirt vision on a weekly basis, but um, you know, it, it just shows that uh, it's all healthy and good for the sport. I think there's so much eyes on our sport more than ever because of the streaming, no matter if it's XR dirt vision or flow, um, there's more eyes than ever and there's more money than ever. So I think it's, it's all good and positive and maybe it doesn't make everybody happy. And, and, and maybe some people get upset, uh, you know, of some of the races that you put on in front of other events, but uh, we'll see how it works out the first year. It might, it might work out great. Yeah. I mean, think about, you know, I, I look at business because from my perspective is I, all I've ever done to make money is it's all been performance based. My whole life is, you know, I don't get a check it all depends on how I finish. And, yeah. and so I kind of laugh at the fact that people get mad about, you know, the competition side of this thing. It's like, it's all, everything's always been performance based. I don't, I've, you know, so, so I got to do good, whether I'm promoting a race or, you know, I'm uh, racing, you know, anything. So uh, I just think it's the way I've, that we are 
you know, uh, wired is, is, uh, you know, competition's mm-hmm. good. I mean, I'm not, you know, when you pass me on the last lap, I go from making, you know, this much to that much. I mean, it's, it's yeah, our, we don't have a salary. We, we don't live stable lives. So, you know, I don't get to just, you know, it, it's, it just is what it is. It's, it's changed my perspective on a thing, everything, you know, I've, I know that if I want to do good at anything in life, uh, I have to perform at a high level and, you know, we're, high limits is going to perform at a high level. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be here for a long time. And, um, you know, let's, uh, let's just, you know, keep working together to, you know, make the sport better. I mean, that that's the goal. Uh, we got a great fan base, dirt track racing's, you know, super great right now. Uh, it's exciting. Your crew chief's trying to, uh, pay me a hundred bucks to, to chug a beer right now. Uh, <laughs> I kind of want to get a hundred bucks from him to do it. So, uh, I don't know, do I have to chug the whole thing, Cody, or can I just do like uh, three quarters? <laughs> I know you can chug. Yeah, I know. I, I, uh, we'll try to keep it somewhat serious, but, but, um, but anyway, Mike no, says it's, here, it's, my, Mike paid for five bucks here. Said, is, is Brad taking us to the bathroom? Is that going to be a thing on your shows? I don't know if you watched, Tyler Swank last week because he was on my show and he took a pee on my show too. So I I had to man. I was I'm over here, you know, two white claws in and uh, I was like, man, I I can either stop the show or I could just be quiet about it. So uh, I'm glad that he caught that. You know, we're we're real people. We gotta we gotta take a leak every now and then. Yeah, it's just funny because everybody caught that with Tyler and and now they caught it again. So it's a trend here lately. But Todd says, what are you guys gonna do with all that money? Well, we're definitely going to have to spend it because taxes will come. But on a serious note, we want to be like Todd. We want to invest in real estate. Uh, we, we would love to, uh, you know, be like Todd one day. So um, do we always got to be do we always got to be serious? I mean, what are we really going to do with the money? Yeah, I, I don't know. Probably buy something cool for. Uh, well, you we know what you're going to do. You're probably going to get a second Viper or another souped up truck or yep. maybe maybe get uh a little bit better steaks. Maybe you'll go up to prime instead of choice. Yeah. Yeah. I need, I want to do Wagyu, but I'm actually, I swear to God, I'm going to have a meat sponsor here moving forward. Oh like, yeah. I, I got a guy local grocery <laughs> store in Connecticut and this is a new thing. I'm dropping the news right here. It's going to be grilling with gravel and we're going to do it weekly. And we got a sponsorship for meat. So it's pretty awesome that people are actually watching my stuff. So it's actually working here a little bit. So it's, yeah. it, it's pretty I, cool. I do give you credit. I'll give you credit. Uh, you, you've, you've worked on your brand and, and you put a lot of effort into these videos. It's uh, it would, it's not something I could do, um, but it is fun coming on here and talking on, on a serious note about racing. And uh, this isn't yeah. supposed to be serious. It could be, this is talk about some juicy stuff, <laughs> but this, you know, we could swear on here. You could talk about anything. We could talk about stories that, nobody yeah. knows about i mean but we don't want to obviously but um <laughs> yeah hey back to we got to answer todd's question because i don't want him docking five dollars out of my deal with him or anything <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. so the money todd because we only can race till we're probably like 40 to 45 years old you know we don't get to work until we're or we don't get to you know make our primary way of living until we're 65 like a lot of people uh so we gotta we gotta make as much as we can and then we gotta save it otherwise uh because race car drivers we're not really good at like labor intensive jobs. We definitely can't have nine to five. So, you know, once we're done racing, we're pretty much uh, lame ducks uh, in the workforce. So uh, I would say we're going to save it. Maybe you can, maybe you can start some sort of fund for us, a uh, real estate fund uh, and we'll invest with you and, and you can help us uh, all retire and, and not live on the streets. So uh, once we're done, you know, racing these sprint cars, I just want a 1% on, on, on a real estate deal. That's all I want. Give me a shot. Well, you're gonna have to give Todd about uh six, seven hundred thousand for about one percent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm screwed. I better win. I better win Eldora then. I'll have to put it all towards that. Uh, all right. Let's see. With Jason Johnson Racing, you had some inconsistency with chassis since you both run the same brand. Was this year any better with chassis feeling the same? Um. Uh, I don't know what he meant by inconsistency with chassis. I would say we I run the same cars, probably nearly identical cars to what I did in the 41 car and probably you as well. I mean, there might be a couple things a quarter inch different here or half inch different there. But I mean, 
in the grand scheme of things, uh, our, the top three in points pretty much have the same cars. Now, wings, shocks, that could be different. Engines could be different. But um, I feel like nowadays with how the tires are, and it's uh, some, something everybody says, but I feel like maybe 15 to 20 percent of the time as a race car driver that you actually like feel good in the car or feel 100 percent comfortable and like all right i could do anything with this thing other than that i feel like you feel uncomfortable quite a bit nowadays i feel like more than maybe it was just because we were younger i'm not really sure but uh it just seems like your window to get your car right and feeling really good it is very small yeah, I agree with that. I think younger, when you're younger and you don't know any better, it's almost easier to feel good. Uh, but when you know like what it's like to feel good, it you work really hard to get to that point. And I agree 100%. I mean, it's just you're always trying to adapt to what the car is going to give you. Uh, you might be going out there thinking you're going to float across the middle and Eldora and you're, you know, you go into the first corner and you can't get the left rear to go down and, and you're going to the wall, you know, like you're going to run the wall the next 30 laps. It's, it's not what your plan was, but I think that's what good race car drivers do is they adapt. And uh, you're always trying to search for the best spot that your car is. And, and it changes through a 30 to 40 lap run with fuel loads and heights and everything. So, yeah, I mean, that's the great thing about sprint car racing. There's no engineering. Uh, you know, these it's just trying to figure out, you know, the best spot to start in a 40 lap run with your car and, let the driver go out there and figure it out. And we all have, you know, uh, great crew chiefs, um, you know, the three, the top three, four or five guys all have, you know, really good crew chiefs. And, you know, that's the difference is just the driver and the crew chief, you know, building that relationship, building that notebook, knowing what to do, you know, getting it close, you know, not taking, you, know, you don't just guess, you gotta, you gotta take your best guess with, that's going to get your best finish you know, so there's a lot of a lot of aspects that go into sprint car racing that fans don't necessarily see. Uh, it's it's definitely not comfortable. You know, the good guys I think just figure it out more often than the the guys that you know haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, um, you got to have a good mechanic nowadays. As a driver, you can't fake uh, being up front. I mean, you can maybe fake a qualifying lap, but uh, even as easy as a heat race, I mean, if your car's not good, you're gonna fall back and. Um, you got to have a good team around you. I feel like the driver maybe does a good job at trying to be consistent and salvaging the best night on that given night, but um, you got to have a good mechanic. So Mike has a, a question, and this is a great one. How do you feel about flying yourself to shows like Don Don? Any thoughts? You know, would you do that? I don't know <laughs> if I would want to fly myself, uh, like actually be the pilot, because one, I don't know if I would be comfortable doing it, but maybe if I tried it, that would be great. Um, that is the dream. I think that is part of Donnie's success over the years, being fresh, being home, running his help, running his family businesses, running his car washes and real estate deals. Like he pretty much lives a normal life of anybody else does. And he hops in his plane Friday morning and will literally fly to any race, race for the weekend. And he's sometimes home Saturday night. If not, he's home early Sunday morning. So to me, that is an absolute dream. If I could do that one day, that would be amazing. I probably can't because it takes a while to become a pilot and you got to log a lot of hours. And then I probably wouldn't be able to afford a pilot and then own my own plane, maintain it and fly it. So Donnie's smart in the sense of he's not paying a pilot and saving the money there, but he has a very successful business and family business and he's been extremely successful himself. So it's a little bit easier for somebody like him to do it. I bet you, if you're willing to live in Minnesota, you could probably work a deal with Todd where you get, you could get hours on his plane. Like every win he gives you, you know, four hours on the plane or something, you know, and then, and then, uh, then you'd have his pilots to fly you. Maybe. Yeah. That, that might be <laughs> something to negotiate moving forward. I could tell you that. <laughs> you should let me do your, your next contract for you with Todd. All right. I might call you real soon then. <laughs> uh, obviously, to answer the question, um, yeah, I think Don, I, I, I respect and admire Donnie a lot. I mean, it's, it's, uh, he's a great pilot. He's, you know, been super nice. And I've been fortunate enough to ride with him a few times on this plane. And uh, it's really cool what, you know, the life that he lives. He loves flying. He's very passionate about it. Uh, you know, to, to David, to the, what David said is, you know, I agree. The, it's part of why he's so successful is he gets to live a little bit more of a home normal life. Um, 
and I think when Friday morning comes around, he's excited to get to the racetrack and, you know, he's got all, you know, he's been working all week and I uh, goes racing, uh, you know, on the weekends and, you know, he'll, he'll fly home Saturday night, 90% of the time. So yeah, it's, it's a little different lifestyle than he lives. Obviously a uh, dream come true. Um, you know, and I think that's why he's been able to do it for 26 years now. It's crazy to think that he's done it that long or how Steve Kinzer did it for, for how long. Um, this guy says, <laughs> Seth, another paid question. Obviously, he, he doesn't know penmanship or, or writing that well here, um, but it says favorite Australian track, uh, opinion of Perth Motorplex. Um, oh, wow. Glad you could read that. Well, <laughs> I, I kind of cut some out. It's a little bit of gibberish, but Seth, we won't. Nice German <laughs> shepherd. All right. Nice German shepherd. Maybe he was typing it for him. That that tongue out there was was uh, typing it for him. But favorite Australian track, definitely not Avalon. That Avalon's like Butler battlegrounds for me, in my opinion. Like not not a good good track. But I like I don't like mine Warnable, but I like uh, what is it Mount Gambier, uh, the King's Challenge. I like that yeah. track. That's that's probably my favorite. I ran Simpson once or twice, and I heard they redid that track, and it's cool. James McFadden said that was a cool track now, um, but obviously I haven't seen it. But I'll let you answer the question, and then we could talk about you're going to Australia and how the hell you're fitting any time for that. Yeah, uh, I love Australia. Um, I love the fans. I love the racing over there. I love the the beer, the meat pies, all the, the cultural stuff that, that goes along with Australia. Um, my favorite track was obviously Parramatta. Uh, but they got rid of that. So uh, second favorite, probably, uh, you know, I mean, Brisbane can be cool when it's right. Uh, Mount Gambia can be cool. You know, it used to be Warnable, you know, when it was right. I mean, Warnable can be fun. It's great atmosphere. I'm kind of looking forward to going back to the classic, just really hopeful that they get the track conditions right. Um, 50th annual, 50,000 to win this year. So, you know, I just, you know, love the, the atmosphere at those types of events um but yeah i mean i agree avalon's you know it's it's tricky uh yeah. flat tiny quarter mile so uh yeah there's it's just different type of racing over there um but i used to love going to Parramatta. yeah that's cool so i mean you got to be on the phone every day talking about this high limit stuff scheduling um you know running chico you know, being part of Kane's screen print. How are you finding time? Is your family going over to Australia? And are you just doing the classic week or what, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I think that's our vacation. Uh, good question because my wife's, you know, on me <laughs> every day. Uh, but yeah, it's been a busy, uh, been a busy year. I mean, obviously, high limits is, is taking a lot of time. That, that 12 race schedule was uh, logistically one of the hardest things I've ever had to put together. Uh, just so you know strategic and and thoughtful and like how to pull it off to fit inside of rules and to get people you know intrigued and not oversaturate anything and you know just it was it was a challenge but it was fun i mean i got to know a lot of promoters uh, i've been able to talk to you know a lot of different people and just hear different perspectives and uh you know just it keeps your mind thinking it it, it just you know i think when you're just a race driver uh you, you know, it's really easy to get caught in just that. So it's nice to to learn, you know, the other side of the business and learn racetracks and things like that. So I've been fortunate now to have Chico. Obviously, my wife does uh, the most with Silver Dollar and Colby uh, Copeland, our other partner. They do the most at Silver Dollar from the day to day. And then, uh, you know, our other general manager, Troy Hennig. So we've been able to to kind of work on Silver Dollar stuff. I went to Reno, did the promoters workshop. So uh, you know, help kind of give my opinion on implementing rules, you know, mm -hmm. the, whether the fire suppression system, you know, I learned about the new tires, uh, you know, just all the other types of rules that kind of come up, which are, which is unique, you know, you, you really have to think differently as a promoter than, you know, when you're just a race driver. So uh, it's, it's been interesting to learn the racetrack side, now the series side, and um, obviously grew up on the, being on the racer side. So um, you know, I, I think it's interesting to know all the aspects and, and to gain the knowledge that I've been able to gain and, and talk to the people I've been able to talk to. It, it's pretty cool. Uh, Australia, I'm only racing three times, but we're going 14 days. So 
it's kind of a vacation for us. That's the time that the phone will get shut off and, uh, you know, we're going to take our daughter to the zoo and, and kind of go visit some friends. And then, uh, I'm going to race three nights is all I'm racing in 14 days there. So, uh, it's just Avalon and then I'll race the classic and, um, you know, and then we'll come home and man, 2023, let's go. Yeah, that's for sure, man. So, People are talking a lot, obviously, but we got a paid question from Derek it says, won't the 100 mile rule be a factor for the million? Again, uh, if you're just tuning in now, man, we are so close to a thousand viewers. So if you're watching this, tell your friends to join in. We just need to eclipse that thousand viewer mark for at least a second because that, that'll be really cool. But again, these are things that we don't know. Um, obviously, when the Outlaws announced their program, uh, this race didn't exist. Um, so now it, it does did, it, it, it did exist and it, people knew did, about it i did ask brian carter straight up you know whether this would and and he said obviously you know there's going to be races that are going to be exempt under that rule i'm assuming he was implying that obviously he's not going to stop his teams and his drivers racing for a million dollars especially yeah. you know go against a partner in eldora speedway you know that that does host six other world of outlaw events through a season so yep. yeah and i think it's in everyone's best interest you know we have to understand what tony's trying to do i i think that you know the pay-per-view thing is just part of all these business decisions and you know obviously i'm sure brian wishes it all it was on dirt vision it's on flow racing uh it is what it is and yep. uh yes i mean the world of outlaw drivers are gonna probably have to use you know, one of their freedom or two of their freedom races. Uh, but, you know, obviously he's not going to stop us from running for a million dollars. Yeah, that that would definitely be bad. That's for sure. Um, again, an in interesting topic. And uh, I think Brian Carter is smart enough to know that, you know, hey, he can't put up the million. And if, our, if he's not going to let people run for it, then he probably wouldn't have many teams racing for him. So um, that's just part of the deal. We got Terrell asking thoughts on the best bull ring in the U.S. River Cities. So River Cities was a track dominated by Donnie Shots for a long time. Every time we went, he won for sure. Now it's definitely a mixed bag on who wins. Um, but in my opinion, I think it's a sketchy track. Uh, I think the fans are amazing there. We sell a lot of T-shirts. The stands are always packed. Um, there's not ever really crazy car count there anymore. But I would say. The, the track is typically the best in the A main. It seems like the track gets slick in qualifying, and then it's kind of slick typically in the heat race, and then they'll till up the bottom or the bottom comes into play, and then it'll change uh, you know, so many times throughout the A main. I think that track changes the most um, in, in an A main. But to me, I like it. It's fun. Uh, to me, as far as the safety side, things need to be improved on it. But um, I, I guess I'm in the middle on it. I think that the good racing helps the safety side of things, but um, I don't love it or hate it, I guess I could say. Yeah, I mean, I echo those sentiment. I mean, I think that basically, you know, before I had my car really, really good there, I was always like, man, this place is tough, and, and I could never figure out how to win there. Donnie dominated. Safety's always a little concern there, the, the way that it's just such a big fall off and, like, how easy it is to fall off and then kind of what's on the outside of the track, but... Uh, when you're just racing and you take that aspect out of it, man, it's it's ob obviously some great racing. You can definitely pass cars there. It can be multi-groove, and uh, we've had some great races. I've I've been able to, you know, fortunate enough to win, uh, you know, a couple times there now and, and definitely have a good feel for that place. So uh, it's fast. I mean, 40 laps goes by there <laughs> quick. I mean, a 10-lap yeah. heat race, you feel like you win about three laps compared to other places. So it's a unique track for sure. Yeah, definitely gets uh definitely gets your heart rate up. That's for sure. Marshall Haynes, thank you for the uh, bronze membership. I appreciate it, guys. I guess nobody's liking the video, so there's 983 on this video. You gotta hit the thumbs up. You gotta hit the like button. Um, so always, any any what? <laughs> always promoting, always working it, man. I love I I like it. You gotta yeah. build that brand. Yeah, well, I'm trying. This is my high limit series, or this is my Chico, right? Uh, the old YouTube platform. This, this is your side hustle. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. This is my side hustle. Um, so I guess is there anything else, Brad? You want to talk about? I guess 
we could ask the question, uh, do you know what you're doing next year? But obviously you don't, maybe don't want to announce that or anything, but um, do you feel like you're leaning towards a certain way? Do you think you'll be running, uh, be a platinum member to some degree? Uh, how, how are you feeling? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm open to answering, you know, those, those types of questions. I mean, we're just evaluating the situation like everybody else. I mean, run numbers, we're going to make a business decision. It's not going to be based off emotions at all. Like, you know, I don't think this has to be an emotional decision. I mean, you know, Casey's always provided a, a good platform for me to race. Uh, you know, we have a great race team. Nap Auto Parts is a great sponsor. You know, the World Racing Group and World of Outlaws have uh, always provided, you know, a, a great place to race for a number of years. Uh, you know, now we have these added elements with the High Limit Tour, this million dollar to win race. So, you know, I think obviously we want to race with the Outlaws this year and contend for a championship against yourself, uh, Carson, uh, Donnie, Sheldon, uh, Shark Racing, uh, all the guys that, that could contend for that championship. We'd like that. Uh, but if there's not a lot of give and take, we're, we're certainly going to evaluate, you know, uh, the overall situation and, you know, make the best business decision, uh, you know, with freedom involved in the decision process. I mean, there's no monetary value you can put on that. Uh, but, you know, uh, a family vacation in the middle of June or, or something or a weekend off when I'm burnt out, you know, uh, is worth a lot. So, you know, that's all part of the equation too. So, um, what about you? What are you thinking? Well, I think we're open-minded and we're luckily in a situation where Todd is very open-minded as well and a savvy guy. So appreciate guys. We got to a thousand mm -hmm. at one time. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys very much. You guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We should have a shot. Jill should get yeah. a shot right now. Yeah, yeah. Let's. Get, what do you want? I, I'm drinking White Claw, so your crew chief is calling me a wuss. But <laughs> yeah, you know. so did your t-shirt guy. He said, "What? What are you drinking over there? Water." So he, he's being rough on you too. Hey, hey, we gotta watch our figure in this off season. It's not, you know, I was sitting around eating all this good food. You, you gain 10, 15 pounds. My crew guys are gonna be looking at me cross-eyed when I come back. It, it's terrible, man. I, I, I lot. I got a gut now. I got a dad bod going hard right now. <laughs> this, this ain't good. This, hey, this, tell Jill. Tell Jill she's gonna get have to get you a gym membership for Christmas here. I know. I know. We got this new gym called D1 that just opened up by us, and it's mostly towards athletes. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a it's a chain, but we, we might yeah. do it. But hopefully, Jill, get me something in the fridge. <laughs> Even if it's a seltzer, I don't care what it is. Oh, we're hey, gonna how's, do that one? how's little Levi doing, by the way? Levi's doing great. Yeah. Get, how's, get, how's, actually, how's mom doing? Mom's doing good. Come here, mom. Pour it in front of the camera. People love you. <laughs> Yeah, Come we want to see you, Jill. Come on. Just they can see you. Yeah, let me this Jill, this is a full Cody, shot. Are you kidding me? Cody says, do a shot, you pussies. <laughs> right here. Have I've you tried before. have you tried this one? <laughs> Shit, I don't have any liquor right here. Unreal. I thought I thought you freaking were a professional and had a full bar and outdoor kitchen and stuff. I mean I'd have to go out to my outdoor kitchen and get Honey, will you go grab me something? No, I think I took it. I took it down to the shop. Crown yeah. Royal salted caramel. This stuff is good. You gotta try it out. Jill, my you gotta help me out. My husband's gonna go get me something. I guess we don't want to look like pussies to your crew chief here. Yeah, so. we don't want to look like we're soft because we're not soft, right? We're men. Yeah, that's right. So if you guys haven't gotten this, is holidays only. Crown Royal salted caramel. It's I don't know if that's what he's sleeping. I just love tequila. Oh, tequila. Oh, that 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 ain't gonna be good, Joe. I need a half a shot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't good. This thing is full to the top. This is not good. Just take a little pull off the bottle. You know? Oh, we got the rocks whiskey here. All right, that's what I'm gonna do. Tequila. Oh, uh, Graham wants us to do a double. Graham, I'm not Australian. I'm not I got enough hair in my chest. <laughs> All right, Cody. If Cody's on this video, let's make him proud here. So Cody Jacobs, Todd Quaring, Casey Kane, this is for you guys. And Eric, too. We'll give Eric a shout out. But this is to a thousand people watching, and uh 2023 is gonna be badass. Yeah, here's Cheers. the high limit tour. <laughs> yep. Cheers. <Ooh. laughs> All right. 
<laughs> Woo. All right, I'm warm now. Okay, so are we pussies, Cody, or not? Yeah, are we men or what? What's the deal? Man, now we're so we're so behind now on these questions, but hopefully you guys okay, like them. Let's let's knock them out quick. Hey, so we can... hey, All right, Joe. We'll, we'll bang them out. Here we go. From Beer Hill at Williams Grove at Port Royal. How awesome are we, the PA posse, to race in front of? Do you get to take it all in when you're at when you are out on the track? I mean, I get booed every time I'm in a dash draw on the front stretch. I, you know, destroyed Stevie Smith, one of their prized possessions at the Williams <laughs> Grove National Open for 50000 And they still can't forget about it. It's eight years ago. Yeah, eight years ago now. So a lot yeah, of people have forgotten about it. But yeah, you got it. You got to, um, you have to uh, love the passion of the PA fans. I, I think it's great, you know, uh, the booing or, you know the shit talking or or whatever it's part I mean, of it man it's it's, it's the just fun, part right? of it i mean at the end of the day like we don't really care to be honest like we're just there to win the race whether it's against pa cars or not but the fact that the fans are so into it uh definitely you know elevates the, the atmosphere yeah i think it's it's just part of the fun right it's just like if you're an nfl team you're going to an away game and everybody's booing you talking shit you know i think it just that's part of the game gamemanship you know if i'm playing basketball I'm talking smack to the guy I'm defending. It just, it just the way it is, and the world of outlaws, uh, you know, at, at PA Posse Land, that, that's a big topic. Uh, so, man, th this guy Rob here talking about the Chaz wrestling al alligator or Chaz naked? That's an easy one. I'm, I'm wrestling yeah. an alligator. That's easy, easiest question we got all night. Alligators. Yeah. Question. That was a waste of five dollars right there, Rob. Yeah, that that is definitely easy. So, touche on that one. Uh, any goals or ambitions for you both outside of racing in 2023? Well, Brad, he, he's older than me. He's an old man. He might look young, but he's he's like 36 or something. But I'm 30. I'm, I'm still old. As far as goals and ambitions, uh, I, this YouTube thing is definitely something I'm passionate about. Um, definitely something I want to build and show people maybe a little bit more of not racing, maybe about um, – my car stuff, or I, I would love to be, if anybody is on YouTube, Cletus McFarlane, that dude lives the dream. In my opinion, he's got millions of followers. He has his own racetrack and he just gets to build cars and have fun with that. So I do that on a very small scale. I don't have people working for me to do it. Um, but that's something I want to work towards. I want to build cars, have fun. If it's drag racing, if it's drifting, if it's road course racing, that's my passion. I like to do it. Uh, obviously, Brad's passion. You know, you got a you got a lot going on in sprint car racing. But my goals and ambitions outside of racing is just building my brand and raising my kid, having fun with Levi, and and uh, you know that's about it. Yeah, I mean that's the same way. I mean, obviously, High Limit Tour is racing. Uh, Kane Screen Print is racing. Silver Dollar is racing, and my car is racing. So uh, try to try to be the best dad that I can be. I think uh, outside of you know, all those business dealings and be a good husband to my wife and, uh, you know, just, you know, try to create good memories, uh, you know, even though we're, we're really busy, uh, you know, with all our business dealings, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. Uh, our whole life is racing. <laughs> yeah. It consumes it, man. That's for sure that you don't have much time for anything else. So this question, uh, Nathan, I don't think we could answer this, uh, uh, one, because it's private and there's a contract that we all signed, and I don't think uh, it would be right uh, to put it out to the public. Um, but uh, we do get money from the game uh, as far as what uh, is disclosed on it. Um, I don't think we're going to share that. Um, but I believe the more uh, games sell, the better it is for the World of Outlaws, the better it is for iRacing, the better it is for us drivers and teams. So um, that's probably all the information I want to give. Do you agree? Yeah. Ditto. Yeah. Ditto. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Well, a lot of people are, you know, laughing the faces. Uh, everybody loves the shots. Some people love tequila. People took shots with us. Evan took a shot with us. Um, hey, they everybody's... better send pictures to our social media. We you know, yep. tweet pictures. at us. Yeah. Yep. Maybe the best, maybe the best picture of uh, someone taking a shot or something. We'll, we'll send out a, uh, some swag to him, huh? Yeah, yeah. Maybe a video. Have you seen the guy that shotguns those beers in a bottle? He's got a mullet. I don't know his name, but he makes like this growling noise. He licks the bottle bottom to top and then tw twirls it and it 
<laughs> forms a tornado in there, and he oh. guzzles the thing in literally three seconds. I it, it, but, man, it's yeah. it's badass. Like if I was a man and could roll a mullet like that and chug <laughs> beers like that, like that is definitely like some prime shit right there. I figured you were gonna talk about my sister or something shotgun. That's what I always hear about. It's my oh, can you shotgun better than your sister? I mean, come on, where do you think she learned it from? Yeah, I, I think yeah, I think Brad's been drinking a while for sure. And so is Caitlin, but she definitely, you know, gets a lot of clout, a lot of fame from chugging beers, that's for sure. Yeah. Let's see. Do we got any more paid questions here? You've probably been on for about an hour and 10 minutes. Do you feel used and abused tonight? No, I'm, I'm having fun, but uh, you know, I'll definitely be looking for my royalty check here at some point. Yeah, I, I got checks in the mail. All right. <laughs> California, it's the seasonal time. It takes a little longer for the mail to come. So honestly, it's been good catching up because you know, I know you're you're a new dad. And I'm out here in California, you're out in Florida. So this is just a, a casual conversation. We got to finally catch up a little bit. Yeah, no doubt. Obviously, I think we talk more throughout the season, but uh, I'm raising a kid. You're raising a series, a racetrack. You're going to PRI. <laughs> I skipped out on all of it, um, just kind of soaking it all in and just, man, I need a break after the season. You, you're not going to have a break all off season, but maybe that's how you're wired. Like t for me, I want to just sometimes not talk about racing and just kind of reset. It's It helps me be fresh and not get wore out. Like I could see how if you're doing this 20 years, how you get you know wore out it's mm -hmm. it, it's pretty easy to it's it's a grueling schedule um you sacrifice so many things so to me i gotta step away chill out and and reset the batteries yeah i think i'm just a i'm just you know probably five years ahead of you you know in your mindset and i think for me it's just like i'm gaining knowledge i love uh you know really good conversation with smart people i just really enjoy you know learning and talking and and trying to you know, basically just learn what's the next chapter going to look like for me. Um, you know, I, I don't think you can just turn 40 and then like turn a page. I think there has to be a transition period. Uh, you know, when it comes time to race here in a month or two, I'll be ready. You know, like I'm, yeah. I'm full bore ready to battle it out again. I mean, that was a great battle this year and uh, you put pressure on me and you know, it's, it was fun right to the end. I mean, it wasn't fun, but it was, yeah. when you look back on these things, like you're glad that, you know, we were able to battle it out like we were, you know, it's, it's way more gratifying, you know, to, to, to have those type of battles than, than not. So I think when I'm in my off season and I'm going through these, you know, I'm learning about the business side of things. I'm able to talk to, you know, people like your car owner and, and other promoters and other, it's just, I actually enjoy those conversations. So it, it doesn't yep. necessarily feel like a ton of work. I feel like I'm gaining knowledge and, you know, I know I'll only be able to drive a race car at this level for so long. You know, that's, yeah. that's a, you really have to come to grips with that, of what that looks like for yourself. I mean, everybody's different. Like, yeah. I agree, I'm not racing until I'm 60 like Steve and Sammy. It's just, it yeah. ain't happening. And yeah. uh, I don't know if that's just like a generational, cultural, what it is type of thing. But I don't know how they did that. Like, yeah, I just I feel, like, I feel like at 40 is, you know, like I, I will probably you know, not want to go past 40 on a full-time outlaw tour at that point. And nope. I don't know what that looks like. So, I mean, you got to start thinking at 36, 37, you know, how to position yourself to make sure that you can live a, you know, the lifestyle that your family is accustomed to and pay your bills and things. So I think that's where I'm at transitional phase, learning, creating knowledge for myself. And, and, and I, and I, I'm very passionate about racing. I love creating entertainment. I have, big ideas and, you know, it's just a matter of harnessing it, figuring out, you know, where to take it all. Well, I'm definitely one day I'm learning and I've been talking to people, but I'm going to have a David gravel named sprint car series in Florida one day. And it might only be a small little series of three Oh fives. Maybe <laughs> I, hey, I, Hey, think big. Don't think small. Think big. Well, I got to I got a tiptoe cause we got this series called the top gun series. That is these, hermaphrodite engines they're all steel <laughs> engines like you know what i mean like it just these engines that don't exist anywhere else it's like the 358 division in pa and 360s cost so much damn money i wanted to talk about the 360 thing with you because you went you said you went to this thing out in the west coast in reno or whatever. yeah actually you can talk about because i actually i've been that's been like the hottest topic besides all this other stuff is yep. this aluminum block 360 thing yeah yep yeah again 
let's add more expense. Okay, we could repair it, but it's still, you know, just as expensive or possibly more. But I just think today the 360 model is completely broken. When I started racing in 2008, a brand new badass 360 was like 36,000, maybe, maybe 40,000. And, and now they're equally as much as a 410. And the pay has gone down. Um, you know, the pay hasn't gone up. Is, isn't about fans. So throw that, out, that part of it out the window because 410 racing, you know, from a promotional standpoint, just is where the fans are at because that's where the, the main elite talent, you know, rises to is 410 yeah. racing. Yeah. 360 aluminum box. I'll say a few things about the aluminum block 360 thing. The aluminum block for one and a 360 doesn't create as much horsepower as a steel block. Yep. Uh, the if we go aluminum blocks with the 360s, it's going to put pressure on the aluminum block industry for 410s and 360s, which isn't good because it's already hard to get a 410 block. So it, it would exaggerate the problem even more. Uh, yep. and, and it would cost $5,000 more to build a 360 aluminum block engine than a 410. Mm -hmm. Those are the things I've gained knowledge on, you know, at PRI and through the promoters workshop that I've been trying to learn, to, you know, cause I am somewhat mm -hmm. influential in making the rule towards this stuff. So I was like, I can't just say, Oh, 410 racing is better, you know, screw 360s. Like you got to really think about how to say it and, and listen and make sure that you're going to make a rule for everybody. Yeah. And, uh, I think the the steel blocks are actually becoming easier and easier to get now. You know, that wasn't the case a year ago. So I think, you know, I I, I don't think that guys are going to want aluminum block 360s. I think the, if the steel blocks are available, that they're still going to be the better engine to have. And I and I don't think that driving the cost of 360 racing up is, a, is good for anybody. Well, I feel like it's the smog out there that messes all you Californians up over there. Because how are they having SCCT races that pay twenty five hundred, three grand, and we got 60, 70 cars, and then we have a 410 King of the West or NARC race that pays more and they can't have a full field? Like, to me, I know it's one of your duties to try to get 410 mm -hmm. racing back stronger than ever in California to bring back that Gold Cup. Because back in the day, you had so many cars to have split fields and, and pay big money. I feel like the last five years, the West Coast of sprint car racing has been an absolute nightmare with Skagit going to 360s. But now we got, you know, Rudin making it a 410 track. So I think there's now a new wave of the West Coast to try to revitalize 410s. But um, it seems like still the rich people or the people that have money to race in California don't really care what it pays. But I still think at the end of the day, those people come in and out of the sport. The people that want to stay for a long time, those things do matter. And it's got to make sense, right? If you're losing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars racing locally, I feel like that doesn't make a lot of sense. I feel like um, in about five years, I feel like the outlook of sprint car racing is going to be a lot different in the 305, 360, 410 sense. Well, I think the influencers, you know, dictate a lot of that. And the biggest races always influence, you know, the kids growing up and trophy cup became the biggest race on the West coast. And yeah. So it became, you know, very incentivized to get a 360 and try to win Trophy Cup. So obviously yeah. once Gold Cup failed, that's when 410 Racing started to fail. And you just don't have that in any other region. Knoxville Nationals, Kings Royals, National Open. I mean, those are 410 races. So, I mean, the California, we got to get Gold Cup built back up. And and as influencers, make sure that, you know, the, the kids growing up, think it's cool to become 410 racers and you know i think there's a lot of money out here and i think that we'll we'll uh you know eventually when you're promoting you have to look you know three and five years out and try to make these you know changes that are going to affect the long-term you know uh effect on things so i i feel like uh we're headed in the right direction there's you know with with what they're doing kevin rudin at skagit getting dirt cut back to 410 racing us at gold cup trying to get back to 410 racing uh, you know i think if we can figure out how to just cheapen up the 360 class so it's more economical for people to get it back to what it was established for uh and then get get the influential races to be back to 410 racing uh more is that trophy cup is there a chance is that is there a chance i mean if i was 
a hundred percent in control of everything. Yeah. I mean, trophy cup would be a four ten race next year. Um, but I mean, the founders have done a great job with trophy cup and yeah. it's been a 360 race and that's, what's been, you know, the influential race on the West coast. And, you know, it's just a leadership thing. It's just, you know, it's not like anyone's purposely done it. It's just, you know, some decisions have been made and, and the ramifications we're seeing it down the road. And, you know, now there's new leadership in spots that hopefully can make better decisions and, and hopefully, uh, you know, change the course of action a little here. And hopefully the West coast will be more aligned with the rest of the country and uh, the kids growing up will use the 360 class like it was meant to be as a transitional class. That, that, that's good stuff there. All right. So we got uh, some more questions and they're behind. Um, yeah. Sir Pig says, why do you think People want or think it needs to be outlaws versus everybody else. Why can't it be just everyone makes a lot of money? Um, you know, I think that's a, a good point. I feel like everybody is hearing this talk of high limit or splitting things up that, oh, there's going to be a split. This is going to be like the USA or the gum out series. I feel like that's not the, not the point. I don't think, I think, uh, everybody that runs the outlaws just wants to make sure uh, they're getting taken care of well. And uh, you know, there's all these little things that build up over the course of the year. So um, I, I don't think it's the outlaws versus everybody else. I think it's uh, you know, all right, there's flow racing and there's dirt vision uh, flow racing is a huge company. Dirt visions, but uh, definitely a smaller company, but has a great brand. They do a great job with the name um, and, and have done a good job in a short time. So I feel like it's just part of competition. Um, it's just the, the world we live in and it, it competition's good for us. And sometimes there might be heated conversations, but I think at the end of the day, our sport is growing for sure. And I think there's going to be bigger payouts because of it. And obviously there is. Yeah. I don't know if I can answer that question much better. I think is, I think that was good. I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not just, you know, you can't narrow it down like that. I mean, the world of outlaws get probably, singled out a little bit because they're the elite series, you know, and that's just why we talk about them. And that's where all the, you know, the best teams and best drivers are, are racing. So, um, you know, it's, it's just sprint car racing in general. We're just trying to get, get in a better spot. For sure. We got another one. Mike says, do you think two minutes in the work area is fair and should there be a visible clock for us all to see like a shot clock? I think that's a great idea. I don't see, we have this big ass jumbotron at every event. Why can't that be split screen or something with a big, big countdown and, and some sort of siren or horn? Um, you know, I think that would create more excitement, more build up. Oh, is he going to make it out? Is he not going to make it out? Um, but I, sometimes there's judgment calls. Uh, it shows one to go or you get a, maybe a half a lap extra or, you know, something like that. Or, you know, you've been hearing uh, the, the famous quote from Carson Macedo, you know, the 49 <laughs> car gets extra time in the work area. But Carson Macedo can his car's broken half, and the didn't car can't, is not even raceable, and he's yelling on dirt vision. Didn't Carson Macedo know the rule that it, every championship you get an extra thirty seconds? Yeah, he he, he should know that. Yeah. <laughs> no, he, I think the forty nine is going to probably get about twenty seconds in the work area this year. But uh, yeah, you, no, I I don't disagree that uh, I think transparency or clock would be cool, even from a race inside the cockpit standpoint. If like if I knew where you were at, I think there's just the only other element that people probably don't understand is like that we have to be pushed off. So you can't just start the car and roll away right at the end of two minutes. Like you're yeah. a lot of times we're waiting on a push truck or there's a lack of, you know, like the push trucks are in the infield and you got to go to the work areas, wait, you know, in a different spot. I mean, I'm not saying uh, that we shouldn't, but I would assume that sometimes two minutes would run out and that, and that the series would have to wait an extra minute or 30 seconds because the car was ready, but the push trucks weren't ready. And that would be hard to explain as all, but yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think it's good. I mean, you know, it's definitely something that is probably going to happen. I mean, in the next year or two that there's going to be more of a clock and more transparency so that those types of conversations end. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. All right, Brad. Well, I won't, I won't kill you. You've been on for an okay. hour and a half. Yeah. yeah. Thanks man. Thanks for having me on. It was fun. Uh, you know, I, we probably will shoot a couple texts or maybe a phone call from now till Volusia. So I probably won't get to see you, but, uh, I had fun. Uh, Cody's Cody doesn't call us a pussy anymore. Cause we took a shot. Uh, <laughs> you know, we got to give your heart, your car owner a hard time and, and, uh, we had good conversation. So, uh, appreciate it. Merry Christmas. Tell your wife and Levi, uh, 
Merry Christmas, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Enjoy Australia. Tell the kid I said hello. She's got the best personality ever. Savannah's definitely one of my favorite little girls, so she she's great. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. I'll give you a call, or you give me a call before you leave for Australia. There's always plenty to talk about. And, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll see you at Volusia for sure. Okay, bud. Thanks, man. See ya. All right. Yep, we'll see you later. All right, guys. Well, that was Brad Sweet. Hopefully you enjoyed – the last stream went for about two and a half hours. This one's at an hour and 40. So um, hopefully we talked about everything. Uh, everything that I wanted to talk about, we did. I felt like, man, the Eldora Million, amazing to have an opportunity to win a million dollars is is awesome. Obviously, um, Brad came out with his schedule, so we got to talk about that a little bit. Um, obviously, Houston's has a high limit race. Um Tickets are going to go on sale January 2nd. Um, we debuted Marlowe's Metal Fabricating in Dover, Pennsylvania. If uh, you're in Pennsylvania and you need something done with metal, uh, he does a lot of like sheet metal type stuff. Um, but if you watch the video, um, it kind of explains all that he does. But he's a supporter of Chad Trout um, and loves sprint car racing. He lives right by BAPS. Um, so he, he's a guy that goes to a ton of races, him and his dad. It's a family business. So thank you, uh, the first sponsor of the channel, and I appreciate that. Um, thank you for the, uh, all the comments. I mean, I felt like uh, we talked about some good stuff after that shot. I felt a little bit more loose, got to talk about some more serious stuff. But in the comments, let me know who you want to see on the show next. I feel like uh, – It'd be really cool to have maybe Rico on. I'm really good friends with Drew Warner, Ricky Warner's son. If we could get Ricky Warner on here, I think that would be extremely entertaining as well. If I could convince uh, you know, him to come on here, it would be awesome. Um, Sheldon, yeah, I could have Sheldon Honshield on here. Spencer Basin definitely could have him on here. I'm definitely going to do a show next week uh, before Christmas, and then maybe we'll take one off in between Christmas and New Year's. I'm not sure, but uh, Sheldon will be a good one. Um, you know, we could have sunshine on here. Uh, you know, that that's definitely Jack Hewitt. That would be that would be hilarious. <laughs> Jennifer Marshall, that's that's great. Guy Forbrook, maybe maybe we get Todd Queering on here sometime. Maybe I could show him that uh, I have a decent show here with some cool things. Uh, uh, maybe he'll come on and and talk about some stuff. He, he's doing an awesome job with all this money to win at Houston's. It's definitely. Pretty cool. Donnie, he might, but he'll be in Australia. I could have Carson Macedo on here. Jacob Allen, I can. So I think there's a good list of people that we can make it very entertaining leading up all the way to Volusia. We probably have a new guy on every week, and it'd be very, very fun. So Rico would definitely bring a crowd, but it might cost me money. That guy, he sells merchandise, gives free stuff away. He's going to be tough to get on here, but I would love to have him on here. Uh, we would definitely probably rip a couple of shots as well and definitely have a good time. Maybe talk about some fun stuff. Hillbilly Ripper definitely won't do it. He's very shy. Um, Kyle Larson is definitely a possibility. Uh, maybe if he watched this tonight, uh, maybe he will, maybe he won't. He's he's a pretty good friend of mine, so I think he would for me. Um, but all right, so just to wrap it all up, the World of Outlaws, we hope uh, to, to race with the World of Outlaws next year on a full-time basis, but we have not made any decisions. Um, I think they offered a decent package. Um, I think it's better for the people in the top three or four uh, as far as pay, um, but the lower tier guys uh, probably don't benefit as much. But, um, yeah, we'll see. With this Eldora Million, I think the rules and the fine print on if we could run Eldora and if it counts against us, to me, in a perfect world, we want to run – the, the high dollar, uh, high limit races, the 50,000 at Lakeside, maybe Lernerville 50,000. You know, we want to race when, to me, if I sacrifice not going home for the week and could race for 50,000, to me, that's a no brainer. Um, but maybe some other races, some tracks like Eagle, Grandview, awesome tracks. Obviously, Houston's, that's a busy time with the Knoxville Nationals. I usually like to fly home after that week because it's such a, a busy week. But if Todd wants us there and we feel like we're ready to go, we'll go and do it. But again, it's all going to depend on what races we can or can't run and we'll count towards that four. Or if they put real hard stipulations on it, do we throw away that extra bonus money and go to those eight other ones? 
um, and, and go to all those fun tracks and, and go race for at least 23,000 every one. But we'll definitely be with part of the Outlaws to some degree. Um, I love the World of Outlaws. One thing that I don't like with the World of Outlaws is the banquet. What we had this year uh, outside on a stage to me uh, was something that I'm not proud of. Um, we bust our butts uh, year round. And I feel like the way USAC does their banquets is an absolute honor. Um, and I think we should be the same way. I feel like it should be first class. It should be as nice as possible. People should be wearing uh, nice clothes and attire. And there's a lot of money on the line. And and like I said, everybody sacrificed a lot. So I hope the World of Olives could step it up in the banquet side of things for 2023. Um, but yeah, we're excited. Uh, Houston's 250,000. Uh, Kings Royal, 175,000. Uh, Knoxville Nationals, 175,000. Um, it, it's very exciting. Eldora Dirt Million, uh, hopefully a couple 50,000 high limit races. Uh, you know, who knows what uh, the West Coast stuff's going to pay at Skagit Nationals. I think we'll get a pay increase, possibly the Gold Cup. We didn't talk to Brad about that, which we should have, but there might be a pay increase at Gold Cup as well. So I'm um, really, really looking forward to it. Uh, I didn't get to see the Lucas Oil Banquet, uh, but – Obviously, the all-star one looks pretty nice, uh, and then the USAC one looks very, very nice. So next week, we will have a show. We'll definitely do it probably around Tuesday or Wednesday. Not sure what day exactly, uh, but this was a big hit. People love the first one. The second one was a lot bigger. We had a lot of great topics to talk about, and obviously Brad Sweet being on, and he's involved with a lot of the stuff going on right now in the sprint car world. So I just want to thank you guys very, very much. I'm going to call it quits here. Please, guys, don't leave yet. Please exit out of the live chat. Give this video a thumbs up. And if you do have a YouTube account, please subscribe. Check out shopdgr.com. We have updated uh, the store pretty much uh, up to date with inventory. We got all our die casts, 164th, 118th. We got beanies, wing panels, T-shirts, koozies. Uh, so check that out. If you guys order like today or tomorrow and we get this stuff out uh, before the weekend, you should have it by Christmas. So if you want to do some last minute Christmas stuff, check out our embroidered jackets, quarter zips, full zips, mm -hmm. um, puffer jackets, um, the big winter coats. I feel like they're all uh, really, really nice quality stuff, kind of like crew style stuff. So uh, thank you guys very, very much. Check it out. Like, subscribe, shopdgr.com. We're going to close it with our sponsor video. Um, we'll talk to you guys next week. We'll announce the guests probably the day before. And uh, love you guys. Peace out. Marlowe's Metal Fabricating, specializing in shearing, CNC punching, CNC bending, MIG and TIG welding, and aluminum spot welding. Established in 1986, Marlowe's handles prototype work to production runs, offering capabilities to custom build a product to meet your specific requirements. Mm -hmm.